The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, and accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the seventh and final day of this seven-day sashin at Mountain Gate in October 2023. But hopefully, it is only the jumping off place for everyone's practice to deepen further. This is important. If we're committing to practice, we're committing to lifelong practice. It's not just uh, something that we try for a while because in the beginning it's very difficult normally and we're liable to want to give up which is why determination is very very important and faith too that you can realize what there's a sense that you can because you can if you persist long enough so because it's the final day of this session and because there are are some folks here for whom it's it's uh, although it's not the first time they've been practicing it's the first time they've come to a seven day sashin I'd like to say some things about practice first of all this practice of susokkan the extended out breath if it's done correctly and with focus and with this openness to possibility that is very important as part of that practice it will take us deeper and deeper and deeper beyond where we are caught and in the process it will allow us to see uh, where we are caught in greed anger and delusion in dysfunctional behavior that we were not even aware of we all want to feel and that's our self-image that we are actually uh, reasonably decent caring human beings acting appropriately in all circumstances uh, our societies however uh, have had an, an impact on this different societies value different reactions to things rather than responses and and so it's kind of important I remember with horror many years ago this was in the 1970s the late 1970s uh, someone asked me to go to a management training course uh, that they were uh, had signed up for but weren't able to go for that particular session uh, so I did and it was it was really horrifying they recommended a couple of books one was look out for number one look out for me ignore anybody else forget about uh, being kind to other people forget about giving way to other people forget about anything except uh, bullying your way through life as number one the other one was um, how to said how to survive in the executive jungle and I have to say that because of the atmosphere of what is spoken about in book number one look out for number one uh, there it is an uh, often so often an executive jungle and we have to fight our way uh, to the top and often we do it by clawing over the tops of other people it's a dreadful way to live and it's horrifying that it would be encouraged in business where it's going to leak into life uh, in life we have enough of that already without any emphasis on uh, implementing it in our business life as well it's interesting that um, one of my sons uh, works for a Belgian company that has long designed uh, engineered and provided the key team uh, to build or to supervise the building of these enormous stages all over the world the likes of the Rolling Stones the Rolling Stones were a long time uh, uh, a candidate for these 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 incredible 
um, stages, which according to my son, uh, stretch high enough that it, they're really building an eight story building in a very few days, two or three days is when they load the equipment in, already planned, already tested, and start uh, supervising the local hire to build it. And then after the whole event is over, they have to undo the whole thing. So he's gotten to know a lot of the members of the various different bands. He, he did uh, a lot of work on the Rolling Stones tours and has all kinds of special gifts as a result of that with their logo on it. Uh, at one time, he even was um, flown back to the United States in their private airplane and is always invited to their parties and, and so on. Um, he, now, now, long, long, he now no longer goes on the road, but uh, he did it for decades and got to know, as I said, the personalities of the different, um, uh, the different musical groups. Um, and when I think it was the, the drummer in the Rolling Stones died of cancer some years back, there were a lot of comments about what a wonderful human being he was and how generous and kind and, uh, he, he didn't look down on anyone. He didn't hold himself up as anybody special. This is the way to go through life. And I can tell you that karmically, it brings very different rewards than if we go through the lookout for number one version of life. Zazen gradually opens us to where we might be caught in, in that book number one behavior. We grow up, we have many different experiences and those experiences we draw conclusions from we're also told things about ourselves, uh, some of which may not be very nice. And so we build a, a, almost like a facade, a fake face that is uh, not like that, that is uh, a nice person, that is a competent person, and so on and so forth. But somewhere in the backs of our minds, we wonder if that's actually true. We have a sort of a sinking feeling sometimes uh, because the uh, negative comments that people have made to us in the past uh, sort of stick. <clears throat> Yet that self-image covers up the incredible beingness, the perfection, the compassion, the wisdom that lives within us. And it also tends to drive our behavior in line with uh, its own version of who we are. So Zazen begins to uh, take the scales off our eyes, so to speak, so that we can begin to see um, the whole complete picture. Part of that is, is a little bit um, disconcerting because when we see that, for example, when we had a particular interaction with somebody uh, that we thought was just fine and dandy, it turns out when we really look at it clearly and see it through the truth, uh, we may have had an attitude of negativity towards that person. We may have had uh, uh, all kinds of ideas about how we were supposed to be and acted out of those ideas instead of the moment just as it was. And again, Zazen will open us to these uh, awarenesses. But that is absolutely essential to leaving them, no longer behaving like that. It is one of the greatest gifts of practice if we don't try to shut it out. And this is one of the things that has happened in the past, long past and or also more recent past, when people are not uh, encouraged to work on the long maturation, which is bringing the, not just bringing those things to light, but not ignoring them, 
but opening to the remorse, the regret, and the sensations in our body of those feelings. And what that does is it almost like creates a, uh, a red flashing stop sign the next time we would automatically indulge in those habit patterns. And we can take pause and uh, choose. It's almost as if that flashing stop sign is saying, do you really want to be like this again? Do you really want to behave like this again? You don't have to. Just don't go there. And it's so much easier to let those habit patterns go. And it can be from all kinds of experiences. When Yangi Mingyu Rinpoche was a kid, he had panic attacks, frequent panic attacks. There was no reason for this. He grew up in an amazing benevolent family. His father was a deeply realized Tibetan Dzogchen teacher. So were his older brothers. And uh, he had a, a pretty nice childhood. He actually started doing meditation at his request uh, by his, uh, you know, to, to, with his father as a teacher. Yet he had these panic attacks and he tried his best to deal with it. By the time he was 13, he'd had a fair number of them and was in uh, the typical extended training of Tibetan Dzogchen teachers. And that is uh, a three year, three month, three day retreat where you are practicing intensively uh, all day long. It includes chanting uh, and uh, some other things as well. And he had a panicked attack in the middle of when they were together in a group and it really fed him up. He, he was tired of having these panic attacks, which is one precursor, by the way, to being able to let that kind of thing go. So he decided he was going to just face it full on. He went back to his room, stayed there for three days, just tuning in to how awful it felt. Not an idea of how awful it felt, but the feelings, the sensations in his body that represented how awful he felt. And after three days, he was gone and he never had it again. This is the en enormous benefit of what is known as the felt sense uh, practice that has been rediscovered by modern psychology. It was known centuries ago in the Tibetan Buddhist practice, but somehow it got lost and somehow it never made it into, into Zen, which of course came through the, the Japanese culture where you just shove everything aside uh, and, and excel at uh, going into your breath or your koan, which allows you, unfortunately, not even allows you, predisposes you to what John Wellwood, who was a, uh, is a clinical psychologist and who started doing Zazen when he was in college. And so his, his Zazen uh, was essentially hand in hand, year by year, with his university training. And he wrote a couple of books about this. He said, it's way too possible to make an end run around our issues if we avoid opening to them when they come up in our Zazen. And when I say when they come up, the sense of them comes up. And uh, if we have reached a point of really seriously ready to let it go, then there will be also a, a sense of, I just don't want to do this again. I'm tired of this. And it will be easier, particularly when the sense comes up, combined with the, the uh, wish to no longer continue that way to let it go. But it necessarily involves the felt sense, the energy sense of that in our bodies. And the reason why we've had so many abuses 
in uh, in the Buddhist community over the the decades is because people didn't do that. It's vital. It's vital because if we are to bring our uh, life into line with what we begin to increasingly realize about being, then we have to uh, go ahead and work with these uh, openings when they when they come up because they might not come up again, but they will still pull our strings in the background. And the, the most important thing, as you know, is the extended outbreath with that accompanying um, openness to possibility. All of us come here with some sense that there is, as someone put it, something beyond the veil. And there is. And it's the true reality. And it is immensely worth opening to, immensely worth returning to, immensely worth becoming. However, as we do this Zazen, particularly in the earlier years, uh, it can feel very, very difficult. For one thing, we're running up against our habit patterns. And habit patterns, I mean, just try to quit smoking. Quit try to, as the advertisement went uh, years ago on TV, uh, thinking of pink elephants. Our, our mind tends to grab on to things uh, like a, uh, a comfort blanket and continue to replay them. And we're, we're, we're trying to make inroads into that automatic thoughting, as Roshi Kaplow used to call it. But we're not trying to do that by um, facing a, a, a thought and saying, I don't want to have you anymore. That doesn't work. In fact, that actually gives it more power. We drop beneath the level of thoughts through the extended out breath. And, and as we extend the out breath far enough, it will automatically uh, require focus on the physical experience along with the yearning and, and we can't do that and think at the same time, which is its major benefit. It takes us down into a deeper place in our psyche and has the potential to free us as a result. We cannot think our way to enlightenment. It is absolutely impossible because thinking creates stories. There's no way to get beneath those stories without uh, doing something that uh, requires focus in a, in a deeper way, which Suso Khan uh, makes possible. And I'd like to read to you uh, some words from a student who learned Suso Khan at a session. And this is what she says writing afterwards. What's wonderful about Susokan is that I could meditative, meditative pierce through my thoughts and physical distractions, no matter where we were or what we were doing. While we were traveling, um, they did a lot of traveling. And um, this is a very important thing to recognize because this is the primary thing you're urged to do to keep your practice going, to keep your practice deepening, to move yourself deeper into the process of coming to awakening. Let me read it again. What's wonderful about Susukkan is that I could meditatively pierce through my thoughts and physical discomforts no matter where we were or what we were doing. Prior to introducing Susokan into my practice, I found it challenging to find Zazen when I wasn't sitting. Now I feel that it, as if Zazen can be found everywhere, which it can be. Which brings me back 
to the line from the Gospel of Thomas that we spoke about during Sanzen. Split the wood, I am there. Turn the stone, and you will find me there. So in every moment, we have the potential to uh, deepen our practice immeasurably, and as a result, move closer to becoming free, and ultimately to open deeply enough, we have an awakening experience, and continue that so that we have further awakening experiences. I remind you that Hakuin, the great Zen master of uh, 18th century Japan, wrote that he had 19 major Kensho experiences and countless minor ones. This is something to uh, emulate in our own practice because every Kensho takes us into more freedom, more clarity, more wisdom, more compassion. All of which is built in, it's just covered up. And the Susokan has a way of piercing through, as she wrote, that covering. Then I'd like to share with you another, another um, quote. This is uh, from a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, uh, a store, a book called Complete Guide to the Buddhist Path by Kenshin Korcho Gyatsu, edited by Kenmo Trinli Chodro and published by Slow Nine. Unbroken practice is like a watchful guard. It is simply unscattered and is free from acceptance or rejection. There is no dual uh, duality of things to be abandoned and their um, antidotes. This is my heart advice. This, this verse and, and the following instructions concern how to continue with Mahamudra practice, which is the other Tibetan form of practice that is quite similar to Zen practice. Once we have received instructions, we have to accomplish them and perfect the practice. There you go with your Zazen, with your Susokkan. Continue, continuity of practice is essential for the perfection of enlightenment. Continuity of practice. When we um, jump in with both feet and great enthusiasm into our practice, uh, then, then after a while we lose that enthusiasm and interest wanes and we stop practicing. Then later on, that inner sense that we do want to become free becomes active again, and we jump back in again and do some more until we get disinterested. And then again. Now, when you practice like this, it's not very productive. You're not going to go very deep, very fast, in fact, you're probably not going to go very deep because you keep staying superficial. Stop, superficial, stop, superficial, stop. Continuity of practice, as he says, is vital. And we, we, when we do our practice, and this is something people do not understand or expect, uh, one of the gifts of Sukhan is that it will open us to all the different mind states that we have um, uh, embodied over the of our lifetimes. Anger, irritation, boredom. And when 
most people have expected when they start Zen practice, it is going to be increasingly sweetness and light. Uh, that's far from the truth, because if we are to become free, we can't override the challenges of our, our history uh, in order to reach that innate perfection that we are. Particularly if we've had uh, untoward experiences in our lives, especially as children, then uh, it is particularly important because uh, that's sitting there like a, a stone in our belly and it, it's impeding our progress unless we simply open to its energy. There's a whole list of, I think, seven different what are known as adverse childhood experiences that have a uh, very strong impact on, on growing up and our abilities to be happy, safe, feel safe, interact well with our, uh, our world. And the top of the list, the most prevalent, is abandonment. When our families um, give many, many instances of when they ignore us or they, they um, ridicule us or don't take care of us, uh, then that, that uh, becomes abandonment. When things happen in our life that are, are uh, our young life in particular, when, for example, someone who be a main character, a main caregiver in our, in our very young years disappears, is taken away from us or dies or is otherwise um, gone. Uh, there's not only pain in that experience, but there's fear as well. And it marks us as being, uh, feeling unworthy feeling not unloved and uh, provides challenges for us in as we grow up because we're always afraid then that the next interaction with someone is going to reinforce that. It's going to be, give us the same experience. They'll be really nice and wonderful to us and then they'll disappear as if something's wrong with us. When I was in seventh grade walking to school back then kids walked to school in cleveland heights ohio uh, i used to cross the street to avoid even encountering strangers because i was so afraid so anxious that i would do something wrong that i would uh, and that it would fall down on me I lived my life like that for a very long time and it was exceedingly painful. Exactly because of my younger experiences. It's no longer there, thankfully, but it took a number of years of Zen practice before it began to wane. So continuity, continuity of practice is vital. If you get bored, taste it. What does boredom really actually feel like in your body? What's it sound like? What's it taste like? Explore it. And then suddenly you'll be back in a much more interesting place in your practice. Don't try to avoid, don't try to abandon, simply experience, especially the felt sense. And then it will begin to dissolve and uh, be less of a hindrance. As we are going through our practice, it is this part of us really, really, really wants to be, become free. But another part of us uh, brings up a lot of fear around that. If we are not who we think we are, if we are asked in a sense to go naked into the world, 
Without that self-image, are we going to act stupidly? Are we going to do awful things? Are we going to be out of control? Are we not going to want to, or, or not going to be able to uh, act in appropriate ways in society? Actually, the very opposite is true. As you become closer and closer to letting go more and more, and that self-image begins to be seen through more and more, uh, there's extreme temptation to replace it with some other identity. But don't, because this is the beginning to freedom. When a baby bird is kicked out of the nest, uh, they don't know that they can fly. But in the need of the moment, they do, if their wings are, are fully, fully developed. And ordinarily, they're not pushed out of the nest until that, that is the case. It's not, not always the case with us, but um, when we have some control over it through our Zen practice, we can either hide from that fear and, and go back into the cave as uh, Flora Catois uh, discovered in her, in her vision that she had not long before she came to an awakening. Or you can walk into the sensation of fear, anxiety. Back in Rochester in the old days when I was head of Zendo and, and running the Sashins, the, there was a, a member who was a big, tall uh, Texan. And he would always come to four days of Sashin. And one day I asked him, why don't you come to the whole Sashin? Why do you stop at four days? And he said, because that's when the, the fear comes up. So I said, well, why don't you try coming anyway? And he decided he would. And the next session, he stuck it out. And on the fifth day, he was literally shaking on his seat. It was visible. But he continued, and the shaking eventually stopped. And at the end of the session, he was, he was euphoric because he had moved through and beyond a great fear. So, I don't like the word confronting because uh, that's not exactly what it is. If we confront a fear, that, that Im implies uh, uh, a reaction to it, uh, a standing off from it. That's not, that's not what we're looking for. And opening to the experience, full body experience. One of the things that can happen if people have been traumatized uh, and that trauma begins to uh, come up, that, that, uh, that sense of trauma can, can come up in Zazen, then we find ourselves um, spontaneously shaking. There is a, a therapist uh, named Peter Levine who discovered when working with traumatized people that the energy that was frozen in the moments of those traumas is locked in their bodies. And if they simply allow themselves to move, to shake, uh, it releases that energy. Now you can't just choose to shake, uh, but you can open to it and feel it and do it if it comes up. And it, and it relieves a great deal of the pressure and the, the uh, energy uh, that was stored in your body in having to freeze during a traumatic incident. If we have experienced something that was traumatic and managed to escape through activity, we don't normally get traumatized. It's a very interesting thing to understand. But if we are especially young children and have no choice, uh, then we, we store that uh, energy of needing to get away from that situation. 
in our body until it's allowed to be relieved. Unbroken practice means that one is mindful all the time, like a watchful guard. Thieves and robbers may come at any time. So the guard of a mansion containing great treasures must be alert 24 hours a day. In the same way, it is important to, to watch our mind since the thieves of attachment, desire, anger, and uh, forget, forgetfulness can come at any time and steal the wealth of our compassion and wisdom, along with our realization of uh, awakening. Once mind is continuously established, an unscattered mind is just there on the spot, whether we are walking, eating, driving, or performing other activities. We can watch the mind and see how our mental state shapes our world. See how our mental state shapes our world. This is one of the things people don't understand uh, about Zen practice or meditation practice, is that as we begin to become more clear in our minds and, and um, see through where we're caught and, and in such a way that it can be let go, our whole interaction, our whole uh, perception of the world changes in line with that. And along with that, our behavior changes in positive ways and we draw to ourselves more positive experiences. This is a natural outcome of deepening Zen practice. And then the last thing I'd like to share is a, a series of quotes from Huang Po, who is also known in Japanese as Obaku, and was the teacher of Rinzai. He was a profoundly awakened human being. And this points to uh, the true nature of mind, which is who we really are. And we can realize that to one degree or another and deepen that realization and open more fully to that realization through our Zen practice. But first there is the slogging through the swamp. All Buddhists and ordinary beings are nothing but this one mind. This mind is beginningless and endless unborn and indestructible. It has no color or shape, neither exists nor doesn't exist. Is it old or new, long, short, large or small, since it transcends all measures, limits, names, and comparisons? It is what you see uh, in front of you. Start to think about it, and immediately you are mistaken. It is like the boundless void which can't be fathomed or measured. The one mind is the Buddha, and there is no distinction between Buddha and ordinary beings, except that ordinary beings are attached to form and thus seek the Buddhahood outside themselves. But this very seeking, uh, by this very seeking, they lose it, or I should say it goes underground since they are using Buddha to seek for Buddha, using mind to seek for mind. Even if the, they continue for may and eons, they will never be able to find it. They don't know that all they have to do is put a stop to conceptual thinking and the Buddha will appear before them because this mind is the Buddha and the Buddha is all living beings. It is not any less for being manifested in ordinary beings, nor any greater for being manifested in Buddhas. And then he also says, this pure mind, which is the source of all things, 
as it says on the scroll behind, out of not one thing, which is called uh, emptiness or the void, uh, which has in immense potential. That's why uh, no words really describe it accurately. This pure mind, which is the source of all things, shines forever with the radiance of its own perfection, which is each one of us. We are the radiance of perfection. But most people are not aware of it and think that mind is uh, just is just the faculty that sees, hears, feels, and knows. Blinded by their own seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing, they don't perceive the radiance of the source. If they could eliminate all conceptual thinking, and, and it's not about eliminating, it's about dropping beneath conceptual thinking, um, letting go of the stories. The, um, the source would appear like the sun rising through empty sky and illuminating the whole universe. Therefore, you students of the Tao who seek understanding through seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing, when your perceptions are cut off, your way to mind will be cut off and you will be nowhere, uh, you will find nowhere to enter. Just realize that although mind is manifested in these perceptions, it is neither part of them nor separate from them. You shouldn't try to analyze the perceptions or think about them, but uh, you shouldn't seek them, seek the one mind apart from them. There is a, a practice that goes along with the Susokan, and that is to um, focus on what you are hearing, only what you are hearing. Focus fully on what you are hearing. Continue the Susokan and, and focus on exactly what you are hearing. Uh, we usually hear and are sort of aware of what we're hearing. But in this case, we want to focus exactly on what we're hearing. Or the same goes for what you're seeing. Ordinarily, what we do when we see something, uh, it is has no, no qualities, no content other than uh, a series of light images that strike a retina in our eyes and then go to the brain where it's interpreted. And this interpretation can be quite in error. For example, there's a story of a, uh, a man in uh, one of the African countries who was uh, supporting um, people that were trying to become free and were, were struggling under apartheid. And then he was drafted and he was sent to shoot these people, to kill these people, these very people that he, he was honoring and believed in. And so he is leading a, a band of fellow military folks through the jungle. And they suddenly stop because there, there's a movement. And what he sees is a line of guerrillas with guns coming towards them. And he raises his rifle to start shooting. And the uh, man behind him taps him on the shoulder and, and whispers, don't shoot. And so this so-called band of guerrillas comes out of, the, out of the jungle into the clearing they're in. Turns out to be a boy leading a herd of cows. And he had a stick in his hand, which this man misperceived as a rifle. This is what can happen to us and happens so frequently um, and almost invisibly. It's, it's not necessarily through sight. We have interactions with people and we jump to conclusions about what they are saying and, and their motives behind it, which may not be at all accurate. And the result is uh, 
pain and suffering, and in some cases, murder and wars. And this is another really compelling reason to dive into your practice so that you're not part of that uh, creation of chaos and suffering. And it works. It works. So keep going on the extended out breath, reaching far with that openness to possibility that will eventually bring you to uh, an experience of what you sense is in the background anyway. And that experience is called enlightenment, but it takes enough thinning out of the self image of the habit patterns of perceiving in order to be able to recognize it. So I thank you for listening. I hope you do continue gangbusters with your practice, even though you're going back to lay life, most of you, um, because it will make a difference. And even though being back in the world instead of in the uh, in the zendo in the in the monastery where where everything is established in such a way as to help enhance our practice, it's much more difficult out in the world of activity with jobs, families, and so on. But as Hawkwin said, to practice in the midst of activity, which means that is 10,000 times, 10,000 times um, worth practice in, in quietude. You do need Zazen to sort of provide a basis for being able to work in daily life. But if you don't have that Zazen, then you're just going to be reinforcing your stories. So do that Zazen as if your life depended upon it, as Roshi Kepler used to say to me, because it does. Freedom is at your fingertips. You just have to persist through the challenges and gradually things will give way and the light will appear in your, in your being. So I thank you for listening. I'll stop now and recite the four vowels.